Good evening, everyone. We're here this evening to talk about the rise and the fall of the great Velozhin Yeshiva. And our sponsor is here. Thank you so much to Shirley tonight. Don't worry, don't worry about that. Our lecture tonight is sponsored by Shirley Eisenstein in memory of her late husband, Dr. Solomon Eisenstein. Zalman ben Issa, Zichren Levrocha, whose yard site is on the 18th of Adar Rishon. His neshama should have an aliyah. We should all be zeichet to see Trias HaMesim. You're going to have to bear with me. It's a long and very roller coasterish story. We're going to begin in a place you wouldn't expect. I like to begin the story at the end. So that's where I'm going to begin. In 1890, a young man known as Chaim Zitomira joined the celebrated Velozhin Yeshiva. Chaim, aged just 17, was an orphan who had been brought up by his grandparents in Zitomir, which is in Volinia. After reading a gushing article about the great Yeshiva in Velozhin, by the budding Hebraist Micha Yosef Berdyshevsky, Chaim begged his grandfather to allow him to attend so that he also become a great scholar by studying in this mythical higher institute of Torah study, where one could learn everything about anything alongside the greatest minds of the Jewish world. His grandfather eventually relented and Chaim made the long journey from Zhitomir to Volozhin to pursue his life's ambition and become a great Jewish scholar. Soon after he reached Volozhin, he was introduced to the Rosh Hashiva, the aged and revered Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, known to all by his acronym, Natsiv. Natsiv means the pillar, the pillar of Volozhin, who told Chaim to prepare, listen to this, a full tractate of Talmud for his entrance examination. As it turned out, young Chaim was quite disappointed by what he found in Volozhin. Berdyshevsky's description had given him the impression Volozhin was a place in which one could study, as he later put it, the seven disciplines and 70 languages. But all he found there was hundreds of boys studying Talmud in the Beis HaMedrash day and night. Oh well, he thought to himself, I'm here anyway. And that Natsiv rabbi seems like a very impressive bloke. Uh, so I guess I'll get on with it and see how things turn out. So he sat down and he studied Tractate Ketubot for three months, day and night, until he had mastered the whole thing. The day of his admission test arrived and Chaim went in to see the Natsiv and he did very well. Meanwhile, during those three months, the Natsiv with his diligent, watchful eye over the yeshiva. And his deep concern for each and every student had be already become like a father figure for Chaim, uh, who had no father. The Natsiv embodied the paternal image young Chaim craved, and he exuded the saintliness and humanity that had made him such a legendary figure in the Jewish world. Chaim wrote back home to his friends to say that the Natsiv had told him he had done brilliantly. You must be a Litvak, the Nativ said to him, beaming. Do you know, this is the first time I have ever tested a boy from Volinia who learns as diligently and knows the Gemara as well as you do. This was an incredible compliment coming from an educator who had been in the Talmud education business for well over 50 years. Almost by default, Chaim now devoted himself to intensive Talmud study. And, as he later said, he had every intention of becoming a lifelong rabbi and a first-class Talmud scholar. But something wasn't right in Volozhin. Over the next few weeks and months, Chaim discovered that the yeshiva was in a state of turmoil. And as Chaim soon found out, there was not one but two secret societies of maskilim, so-called enlightened groups of boys who clandestinely studied secular books and read Haskalah journals. Now, suddenly, Chaim understood what Berdyshevsky had been talking about. It wasn't Volozhin Yeshiva that was teaching seven disciplines and 70 languages, 
The boys were learning that themselves. Meanwhile, the faculty was in complete disarray and his hero, the Natsiv, once the most respected and admired rabbinic educator in Europe, possibly the world, was collapsing under the strain of internal strife and external pressures. Just over a year later, Chaim Zitomira, better known to us as Chaim Nachman Bialik, left Volozhin Yeshiva and went to Odessa, the seat of secular Jewish scholarship, where he soon abandoned his religious observance and over time became a champion of Haskalah, as well as a renowned cultural icon. And one of the most famous early Zionist pioneers who eventually moved to Tel Aviv, where you can still visit his house and see his library and study. Bialik wrote several iconoclastic poems about his experiences in Volozhin Yeshiva, the most famous of which is called Hamasmid, a wistful description of the devoted Talmud student dedicating himself to the endless study of Gomorrah in the hope that he will become the next Rabbi Akiva. With a head start, of course, because Rabbi Akiva only started at the age of 40. Only to realize too late that he has wasted his youth on futility and nonsense and has lost the opportunity to become a rounded scholar in so many other areas that might have interested him more and served him better. Bialik bitterly condemns the yeshiva model that he sees as stifling, promising youngsters and preventing them from realizing their true potential. And he declares proudly that he has deliberately pitched his tent far from that milieu, a milieu he clearly despises with a passion. The poem became so famous that it later had a street named after it in Israel. No one can doubt Bialik's intellect, nor his passion for his Jewish heritage, nor is there any doubt that Volozhin was the premier institute of higher Jewish learning in the world throughout the 19th century. By the time Bialik got there, it had been open for almost 90 years. But within a year of him leaving Volozhin, the yeshiva was shut and shuttered, and the great Natsiv was left like a ship without a port, a broken man who soon died far away from home in Warsaw, where he was buried, a tragic end for one of the greatest Jewish educators of modern Jewish history. What went so wrong? How could the glory of a Lozhin Yeshiva descend into this terrible mess? If you read the accounts written by the Frum world, at that time and since, all the blame is put on attempts by the Russian government to insert secular, Jewish stu uh, secular studies into the curriculum of the yeshiva. Rather than compromise the integrity of his beloved institution, the Natsiv shut it down to prevent the influence of Gentile and irreligious Jews destroying the yeshiva and its students by teaching them forbidden knowledge. But as you can imagine, the story of Volozhin is rather more complex. Just to give you a taste of that complexity, if I may, allow me to present you with two questions before I give you the full history of the yeshiva leading up to its humiliating closure. The first question is this. If the Russian government was so intent on inserting secular studies into the Volozhin curriculum because they were concerned that the yeshiva did not offer a fully rounded education, why did they not similarly insist that other long-standing yeshivas in Russia offer secular studies, yeshivas such as Slabodka, Kovna Kolel, Mir, Kelm, Tells, just to name a few. Secondly, on several occasions in the past, the Russian authorities had attempted to impose secular studies in Volozhin, and all of those attempts had either been publicly and successfully repudiated or officially adopted, but essentially ignored. If that was the case in the past, why on this occasion did the Natsiv simply give up and close the yeshiva? Surely he could have used the same tactics that had, su had succeeded for him in the past and not resorted to the drastic measure of shutting down the yeshiva. We will eventually get to answering these questions and many others, but before we do, let's look at the origins of Volozhin Yeshiva. The first thing to realize about Volozhin 
is that it was not a thriving metropolis like New York or London or even Vilna or Warsaw. Here it is on the Google map, a tiny speck northwest of Minsk. It was actually a small pass-through town, an overnight stop on the main road between Vilna and Minsk. It remains insignificant to this day, so much so that it does not even feature on the maps put out by the Belarus Tourist Ministry. Although places like Navardok, Slonim, Pinsk, Slutsk, Baranovich and Babroisk are featured. In which case, we really need to understand how did the most legendary yeshiva of all yeshivas end up in this minor one-horse town? The answer to this question is a man called Chaim Itzkovitz better known to us as Rabbi Chaim of Volozhin, the powerhouse rabbinic leader of Lithuanian Jewry, who just happened to be the rabbi of the tiny Jewish community in the small town of Volozhin, and who, despite his renown, and for other reasons that remain unclear, chose to open this unique institution and to remain there even as he and his institution continued to grow in fame. Rabbi Chaim of Volozhin was actually born in Volozhin in 1749, where his father Yitzchak was a communal leader. Rabbi Chaim's younger brother, Shlomo Zalman, who tragically died at the age of 32, was a student of the Vilna Gaon, and possibly more attuned to the great Gaon than his older brother, who studied with other rabbis before coming into the orbit of the Gaon. His first prominent rabbinic educators were Rabbi Arya Leib, Gunzberg, and Rabbi Rafael HaKohen Hamburger. Rav Gunzberg was the author of one of the most famous halachic works of the 18th century, the Shagas Aryeh. And here he is weirdly portrayed after he died at the age of 90. Why they couldn't have painted him while he was still alive is an unsolved puzzle, but there you go. I mean, he definitely lived long enough. The Shagas Arie was a brilliant scholar, beloved by his students, but he seems to have had a very sharp tongue, by which I mean he didn't suffer fools gladly, or indeed at all. After several year, years running a small yeshiva in Minsk, the Shagas Arie fell out with the local rabbi, Rabbi Yechil Halpern, and as the controversy escalated, he was unceremoniously unceremon hounded out of town in an ox cart. He briefly became the rabbi of Volozhin and later on rabbi of Metz in France where he also argued with the local community leadership. In Metz, this is how far the argument went, he eventually refused to go to shul except on four occasions each year. But I digress. In any event, while the Shagas Arie was the rabbi of Volozhin, Reb Chaim of Volozhin studied with him. As a young teenager, Reb Chaim also studied in Minsk under the great scholar Rabbi Rafal HaKohen Hamburger, who later on became the Rabbi of Hamburg, and who, you will recall, exposed the guy who pretended to be the Vilna son in 1796. Both of these rabbis were the premier Talmud and Halacha educators in Lithuania during this period of the 18th century, but the star of Lithuania was undoubtedly the Vilna Gaon. The Vilna Gaon, as we learned in my last lecture, was widely acknowledged as the greatest rabbi and rabbinic scholar in Lithuania, although he never occupied an official position. He was not the rabbi of a community, nor even a shul. He did not have a yeshiva, nor even a base medrash. A few select boys, all of them uniquely gifted, were chosen to study with him on the very rare occasions when he emerged from hours of solitude study. In fact, Reb Chaim only got to know the Gaon at the age of 19, in 1768. But very soon, he evolved into the Gaon's closest and most trusted student, and for the remaining 29 years of the Gaon's life, spent as much time as he could with his mentor. Such a status boded well for Reb Chaim of Volozhin, who could have become the rabbi of any of the major communities in Lithuania and beyond, but he chose Volozhin. Perhaps it was a sentimental choice. Perhaps he saw it as a stepping stone so that he could get some experience and a better job later on. Actually, in 1790, Reb Chaim was appointed to become the rabbi of Vilkomir. The community there was twice the size of Volozhin. 
But after just a year in Vilkamir, Reb Chaim was back in Velozhin where he stayed for the rest of his life. In 1797, the Vilna Gaon died, leaving in his wake many devoted students as well as a messy battle with the Hasidim. The battle continued apace and even involved the Gentile authorities as the virulent opponents of Hasidism dug in their heels in attempts to outpace their mentor and each other to uproot Hasidim from any area under their control. But Reb Chaim never involved himself in the ideological war against Hasidism, nor in the parochial battles against Hasidim. In fact, anecdotal evidence suggests that he had good relations with Hasidim then and until the end of his life. This was in spite of the fact that for all intents and purposes he took over as the leading rabbi for Litvaks, Lithuanian Jews, after the Vilna Gaon died. He had a hand in every major communal decision and was widely consulted in halakha and hashkafa, but his most enduring achievement was that in 1802 he opened a yeshiva in Volozhin. We are not sure why he opened the yeshiva, and there is no reliable evidence to support any of the three claims made in this regard. Some say that he opened the yeshiva at the request of the Vilna Gaon, or perhaps at his instruction. But if his mentor had instructed him to open a yeshiva, why did Reb Chaim not open it during his lifetime? Why wait for five years after his death? And there is no mention of this request in any of the promotional literature issued at around the time the yeshiva opened. The idea, therefore, cannot be taken too seriously. Others suggest that Reb Chaim felt that the misnagdim world needed an institution to beat back the threat of Hasidism. But although we know that Reb Chaim wrote a book called Nefesh HaChaim to counteract the Kabbalistic approach of the Balhatanya, by the way, the only known written evidence of Reb Chaim of Elogin's opposition to Hasidim, Reb Chaim insisted that this book could only be published after he died, which it was, and as I've already mentioned, Reb Chaim never displayed any personal animosity towards Hasidim during his lifetime. His opposition to Hasidim, Hasidism, seems to have been purely at a theoretical level. To therefore suggest that he wanted to open an institution to uproot Hasidism or to be against Hasidim is a real stretch. And again, no such claim was made by him at any point around the time of the yeshiva's opening. So, we come to the final reason given for the yeshiva's launch in 1802. And the one which I hinted at towards the end of my lecture on the Vilna Gaon, the decline in Torah knowledge and Torah study which resulted from the Hasidim or maybe the Maskilim at around this time. But once again, there is no real evidence of a quote-unquote decline. True, the Hasidim attracted less learned people, but their rabbis were clearly great scholars and the less learned people had existed long before Hasidim arrived. The only thing you can say is that the Hasidic movement enfranchised them. I would therefore like to suggest that it was none of these three reasons that prompted the opening of the yeshiva, and at the same time, it was a bit of all of them. Reb Chaim of Alojin was conscious that his mentor, the great Vilna Gaon, was gone, and he was looking for a way to carry forward the Gaon's extraordinary legacy of learning and scholarship. What better way than to open a superlative yeshiva? The Vilna Gaon did not need to actually instruct his primary disciple to do it. It was self-evident. Secondly, there was also the growing trend of some Hasidim who belittled learning and scholarship by opening an institution where anyone who wanted to study Talmud, including Hasidim, could attend and thrive, might just shift the paradigm and prevent the decline that Reb Chaim of Elozhin detected as a distinct possibility. The real point is that the Lozhin Yeshiva was utterly unique. It was not envisaged as some little room somewhere at the back of a local community shul where a few boys gathered and studied and heard a shear from the rabbi of the town. It was a standalone institution in its own independent building, not just serving the town in which it was situated, but the world. The model was not a yeshiva that had existed in Lithuania or Russia or Poland, in the recent past, but rather it was the yeshivas mentioned in the Talmud. 
Yavne, Sura, Pompadisa. The Lojim was to be a yeshiva run by the Rosh Yeshiva, not influenced by the politics of non-rabbinic lay leadership or by petty community politics. Funds would be raised locally, of course, but official collectors would solicit funds from across the Jewish world. In any place where Torah was appreciated and valued, the yeshiva of the Vilna Gaon's Talmud in Volozhin would be promoted as the foundation for the future of the Torah and Judaism everywhere, not just Volozhin. Perhaps that is why Reb Chaim chose to stay in such a backwater. So no one would ever say that the yeshiva was a local institution. How could Volozhin be a local institution if the boys in the yeshiva outnumbered the adult members of the local community as they very soon did? One of the major changes instituted in Volozhin that made it differ from the pre-existing learning centers run by communities was the idea of Torah Lishma, Torah Lishma, learning for its own sake. In other words, not in order to become a rabbi or a shochet, wholesale intensive study of Talmudic tractates guided by a rabbi or rabbis, but essentially with one or more learning partners of your own age, simply so that you could excel at Talmud study and become a scholar of breadth and depth, unbridled and unlimited. One fascinating story about Reb Chaim of Olozhin was that he realized he would need hundreds of Gemaras to cater for his students. But volumes of Talmud were both expensive and rare. So he sent a group of collectors to go from community to community to collect their unused Gemaras and Talmud-related works for the yeshiva, Soon, Volozhin had one of the largest libraries, if not the largest library, of any Jewish center of learning in the world. Reb Chaim of Volozhin died in 1821, having successfully established an institution of great repute. He was replaced by his son, Reb Yitzchak, known in the yeshiva world as Reb Itzela Volozhin, as both Rabbi of Volozhin and as the Rosh Hashiva. No one questioned this succession as he was his father's only son, and he had been deeply involved in the affairs of the yeshiva during the last years of his father's life, after Reb Chaim was paralyzed by a stroke. All the evidence is that he was a wonderful man, a devoted administrator, a learned scholar, but nowhere near as great a scholar or charismatic leader as his father had been in his prime. Nevertheless, when the Jewish reformer Dr. Max Lilienthal met him in 1842 as a messenger of the Russian government to discuss promoting enlightenment in the traditional Jewish world. The first attempt to introduce secular studies into Volozhin Yeshiva, he was impressed by the man he met. In his memoirs, he spoke about their meeting in detail. This is what he said. Rabbi Yitzchok of Volozhin spoke perfect German, Russian and Polish, although he knew very little about the literature of those languages. He understood it was no longer possible to delay reforms in the field of education. And even though he feared for the fate of his yeshiva once these reforms were carried out, he would never refrain from re supporting the reform of educational methods. Do not think, said Rabbi Yitzchak, that all Jews trust me. They suspect that I lean towards reform, that I'm in favor of the government's programs. Don't take, by the way, what Rabbi Itzla is reported to have said by Max Lilienthal too seriously. As we shall see, the leaders of Volozhin Yeshiva were adept at playing the authorities, telling them what they wanted to hear. Lilienthal was no friend of the Yeshiva, and lying to him to protect the integrity of the project was part of the Mulchamo Hashem, the wars for God, that defined the MO of the traditional Jewish world in Russia, and that would dominate all forays into the public sphere for Volozhin until it closed. But the fact that Rabitzela was fluent in multiple languages was definitely unusual. Perhaps this was why some in the traditional world frowned at him, and this was what he was hinting at in his conversation with Lilienthal. Whatever it was, the yeshiva under Rabitzchak, Rabitzela, definitely shrank. Some suggest to less than 100 boys, in Reb Chaim's day, the total number of students had possibly exceeded 300, making the largest European yeshiva in history. There were various deputy Rosh Yeshivas during Reb Itzela's era. 
such as his nephew, Rabbi Avram Simcha, later the Rav of Amsislav, and also, also Rabbi Lezer Yitzchok Fried, a grandson of Rabbi Chaim of Volozhin, and therefore Rabbi Zilla's nephew, who was married to his first cousin, Rivka Miriam, Rabbi Zilla's eldest daughter. In 1839, at the age of 30, Rabbi Lezer Yitzchok became sick. His duties were reduced, although he still remained active within the yeshiva, and later played a role in the succession battle when Reb Itzela died. But without any doubt, the first among equals on the Belozhin faculty was Rabbi Naftali Yehuda Tzvi Belin. Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Belin, the Tziv. Reb Itzela's son-in-law, who was married to Reb Yitzchok's daughter, Reina Batya. Herself an interesting woman, at least according to her nephew, Reb Baruch HaLevi Epstein, author of the Torah Tamimah, but we will discuss him later on. In fact, before I talk about the Nativ and the success and sh succession shenanigans at Velozhin, I'm going to digress. Because first of all, I need to clarify something that we all take completely for granted, but which until the 19th century absolutely <coughs> did not exist in Jewish life. I'm talking about family succession, in which the heirs of an elder generation inherit the title and institution belonging to previous generations. That what is so curious is that this entire concept was almost non-existent in Jewish life until the 19th century, when it suddenly appeared in both the Hasidic world and the yeshiva world simultaneously. The rabbi of a town had historically always been chosen by local community leaders based on merit, namely scholarship, possibly temperament, and if I'm being brutally honest, cynical, money. Yes, if you had a wealthy father or father-in-law, and of course you had to be a rabbinic scholar, you were far more likely to get a good rabbi job than the rabbinic candidate who came from a poor family. And when an incumbent rabbi died and the post was up for grabs, there was no protocol which demanded that his son or son-in-law replace him. Although, of course, it did happen occasionally. But that was the exception, not the rule. But in the early years of the 19th century, something very strange happened. The Jewish world suddenly had rabbis and institutions that were not controlled by community leaders or funded by one community. Hasidic rabbis were independent as their following grew, and as their following grew, so did the value of their business. So that when they died, the family was not willing to relinquish it in favor of the worthiest disciple. The business had to be kept within the family. A son had to become the next Rebbe, and so an aura was created around the son or sons who were treated like crown princes from a very young age, so that if at any moment the father died, the title would immediately pass onto the son, and the income from the Hasidim would not be lost to an outsider. Most famously, this is what happened when the first Rebbe of Chabad, Reb Shnir Zalman, died. His closest student was Reb Aaron Halevi Horovitz. Not only had he spent the most time with Reb Shnir Zalman, but when Reb Shnir Zalman was imprisoned by the Russian authorities, Reb Aaron travelled from town to town raising money to have him released. But when Reb Shnir Zalman died, his Hasidic group was inherited by his son, Rav Dov Bear, a group that and Rav Aaron had to leave to form his own by his son in a place called Strachelia, a group that was, ironically, inherited by his son Chaim Rafal when he died. By the way, one of Rav Aaron Halevi's grandsons was a man called Michael Levy Rodkinson a pseudo-academic who was the first person to so-called translate the entire Babylonian Talmud into English. The translation was so bad and inaccurate that literally the only reason it is ever mentioned is because it was the first translation. In any event, when Rodkinson, the Strachelia Enikel, died in New York in 1904, he was buried next to his third wife, a Gentile, in a Christian cemetery. Definitely a candidate for my rogues, rascals, and rapscallions lecture later this year. By the way, he is distantly related to former chief rabbi Jonathan Sachs. So how did we get here? Ah yes, succession. Let's go back to Velozhin Yeshiva. Just like Hasidic groups that turned into a dynasty due to their independence and brand value, Velozhin Yeshiva was also an independent institution with no financial or governance ties 
to the local Volozhin community, and it too turned into a dynasty. All the money came in via donors collected by independent collection contractors, Meshulochim of the yeshiva, who were given cities or regions in which to raise money, part of which they could keep for themselves, but the majority of which went towards the upkeep of the yeshiva, salaries, expenses, capital projects. And all of the management decisions were made by the founder of the yeshiva, Reb Chaim of Olozhin. And after he died, is his heir, his heir, Reb Itzela. If there was any meaningful involvement by non-family members, it was purely to help with fundraising and to offer advice. Final decisions were made by the Rosh Hashiva. This was a complete break with protocol. So was it a positive development or a negative development? More than 200 years later, the jury is still out. On the one hand, the fact that rabbis became masters of their own destiny changed the shape of Jewish life, allowing for the growth of, growth of dynamic movements like the Hasidim and dynamic institutions like Volozhin. But on the other hand, it also resulted in rampant nepotism, often leading to damaging succession battles, a problem that persists to this day with Satmar in New York and Ponovij in Bnei Barak, just two examples of many current succession issues that exist in the Jewish world. Anyway, after Reb Chaim of Volozhin died, as I said earlier, Reb Itzela took over. He was the natural heir. There was no competition, no pesky brothers who wanted the job. They were happy for him to have it, nor were there any charismatic brothers-in-law vying for the position. Perhaps at that stage, the family saw the yeshiva as more of a liability than an asset. But when Reb Itzela died in 1849, things were not quite so simple. His only son, Elior Zalman, was not interested in the position of Rosh Hashiva, which meant that the position had to go to a son-in-law. The natural heir in that situation was Reb Lezi Yitzchok Fried, as he was the oldest son-in-law and a grandson of Reb Chaim of Volozhin. But other than these credentials, there does not seem to have been a good reason for him to have succeeded to the position of what had become the most important yeshiva in the world. Reb Lezi Yitzchok's illness also seems to have prevented him from going on fundraising trips. So he asked his nephew, Eliod Tzvi Soloveitchik, to find donors for Volozhin in Germany. Eliod Tzvi Soloveitchik is yet another character for a future lecture. One of the strangest Orthodox rabbis of the 19th century, whose gushing ecumenical books about what a wonderful Jew Jesus was, ended up being used by missionaries to attempt to convert Jews to Christianity. We'll get to him at some point. As Reb Lezi Yitzchok weakened towards the end of his life, his leadership was challenged by Reb Yeshua Heschel Levin, whose wife was Elio Zalman's daughter, making her Reb Itzler's granddaughter. This was Rabbi Levin's second marriage, and although he was nine years younger than Reb Lezi Yitzchok, he was approximately the same age as the Nitziv. Despite the fact that he moved to Volozhin when he got married, he was not invited to give lectures in the yeshiva. And so he began to invite students to his home and gave shiurim there instead. It was, all, it was clear to all that Rablazi Yitzchok was fading, although he was still only in his early 40s. And it was also clear that there were only two contenders for the Rosh Yeshiva position. The Natsiv, as son-in-law of Rab Itzela, and Rabbi Levin, who was Elior Zalman's son-in-law, and he could say that his claim was actually his father-in-law's claim because he was the only male heir and therefore was stronger according to Jewish law. The succession dispute was not merely about controlling the family business, although obviously this was front and center. There was also another factor. According to Rabbi Levine's nephew, the famous Hebrew publisher Elior Zev Levine Epstein, his uncle wanted to shift focus at Volozhin Yeshiva and start training Orthodox rabbis for the Russian Empire by setting up a formal curriculum with exams and oral tests, an idea that was fiercely opposed in traditional circles. 
And not surprisingly, his fiercest opponent was his uncle by marriage, the Natsiv, who adamantly believed in the integrity of the learning program at the Lojin, which was all about Torah Lishma, and not about training young men for the rabbinate, although many of the Lozhin graduates did become rabbis across the Russian Empire and beyond. Rablazi Tokfri died on September 22nd, 1853. He was 44 years old. He was hardly in the ground, and the yeshiva erupted in a frenzy, with supporters of both candidates even coming to blows as they fought for their rabbi to become the new Rosh Hashiva. <laughs> rabbi Levine and the Natsiv were not on speaking terms, so there was no way this fight could be sorted out within the family. And third parties would be needed to resolve the dispute. An ad hoc group of supporters of the yeshiva was formed to find a solution. As I said earlier, ordinarily, no decision regarding the yeshiva was made by outsiders, but there was no choice. Two senior rabbis, one from Vilna, one from Minsk, were called in to sort things out. On November the 24th, two months after Ablazi Yitzchak died, the two rabbis published their verdict. The Natsiv would be the Rosh Hashiva, while... Rabbi Yosef Dov Yosheber Soloveitchik, never previously involved at Volozhin, would be his deputy. Rav Soloveitchik's connection was his grandmother, Relka, who was Rav Chaim of Volozhin's daughter, which meant that once again things were staying within the family. The Volozhin bloodline was at the helm of Volozhin Yeshiva. And although the Natsiv and Rav Soloveitchik were a generation apart, they were roughly the same age. Three important factors emerged out of the first major succession dispute of the Lozhin Yeshiva. The first was that although the Natsiv was not himself a descendant of Reb Chaim of Lozhin, only married to a descendant, he was chosen to lead the Yeshiva. This was a major coup. The second factor was that the administration of the Yeshiva still had to include a descendant, which was why Rav Soloveitchik was brought in, a fact that the Natsiv resented, and which would later become a source of more conflict. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, even if family members were not chosen to be part of the administration of the yeshiva, they could still make a financial claim and demand that they be paid from the yeshiva's coffers. Because, as it turned out, the Lozhin yeshiva was a family business. On that basis, Elior Zalman, son of Rabitzilla, was paid 700 rubles, a large sum of money, to walk away and relinquish his son-in-law of Levine's claim, and his family was given a stipend payment in perpetuity. In other words, Descendants of Reb Chaim of Elozhin had rights to the revenue, dividends, of the yeshiva, even if they did not own it. Namely, although they did not own actual shares in the Volozhin yeshiva asset, they were entitled to income. Perhaps we re could refer to it as dividends without stock. Quite a unique financial product. Perhaps a fourth factor worth considering, was the involvement of outside arbitrators. Although, as the Nativ consolidated his power within the yeshiva, he would work to prevent this factor from impeding him in the future initially to his advantage, but ultimately to his great disadvantage. In fact, I think the time has come for us to take a look at the Nativ, as we've mentioned him so often, and he will dominate the remainder of this lecture. Rabbi Amfatali Nitzvi Yehuda Berlin was born in Mir in 1816. His father, Rabbi Yaakov Berlin, was a rabbinic scholar from a well-known family who moved to Eretz Yisrael in his old age and died and was buried in Jerusalem. Legend has it that the Nitziv was not a particularly diligent student and that one night, as a young boy, he overheard his parents discussing his poor progress in Torah studies. And the fact that it made more sense for him to learn a trade so that at least he could earn a living. As a result of overhearing this conversation, he applied himself to his studies and excelled, which then enabled him to marry the daughter of Reb Itzela of Volozhin when he was just 13 years old. But according to his nephew, Reb Baruch Halevi Epstein, 
His early years at the Lodging were very difficult. He was treated like an outsider, and even his wife and father-in-law did not have a good relationship with him. He buried himself in his studies, and he ultimately became one of the most outstanding rabbinic scholars and educators of the 19th century, a polymath who was comfortable and knowledgeable in every field of rabbinic study, pshat, drush, londus, halacha, hashkofa, everything. Earlier, I promised I would devote some attention to Rabbi Baruch Halevi Epstein, and his version of events, so let me keep that promise. Rabbi Baruch Epstein was the son of the distinguished Rav of Navardic, author of the Orach HaShulchan, Rabbi Chil Michal Epstein, who was married to the Nitziv's sister. Rabbi Baruch Epstein is best known for authoring the famous Torah Tamima commentary on the Torah, in which he gathered together all the Talmudic and Midrashic sources on verses in the Torah and elaborated on them. It is a brilliant work, incredibly original and full of wonderful ideas, illuminating the Torah through the eyes of Chazal. Rabbi Epstein also authored memoirs titled Makor Baruch in no less than four volumes. That's Russians, right? If you can say it in one word or 50, let's try a thousand. When Rabbi Baruch's aunt, the Nativ's wife, died, the Nitziv then married his niece, Rabbi Epstein's sister. So besides for being his uncle, the Nitziv now also became his brother-in-law. If I may, let me quote with some minor edits and alterations my dear friend, the great rabbi and scholar, Rabbi J.J. Shachter, who wrote this article in 1990 about a translation of Makar Baruch that was published by Art Scroll in 1988. Here it is. In May 1988, Masora Publications printed as part of its Art Scroll History series a book titled My Uncle the Nativ. This volume is an English rendition by Moshe Dombe of parts of Makar Baruch by Rabbi Baruch Halevi Epstein, which contains a great deal of information about the Nativ. This new English version of Rabbi Epstein's work was published with an approbation by Rab Nachman Bullman of Kirat Nachliel in Israel, who wrote, here's the quote, an English rendition of Rabbi Baruch Epstein's Makar Baruch is long overdue. The experience of Torah life derives first and foremost from Torah learning. But the impact of Torah learning is immeasurably richer when the lives of living Sifrei Torah, of Torah sages, become educative models for our people. Further, such lives are vital links in the chain of Jewish historical knowledge. Makar Baruch is a matchless compendium of biography, memoirs, and law. It was authored by a celebrated son of the greatest yeshiva in modern times, Valojin. In it, the quality of life and the love of Torah and Israel of Lithuanian Jewry came alive. A glowing portrayal of Olojin and its last central figure, the venerable Nitziv, is a major part of the work. Soon after its publication, the book was mailed by the Lakewood Cheder to a number of potential donors as part of a fundraising effort. However, a few months later, the administration of the school had a change of heart. And in a letter dated July 7th, 1988, its executive director, Rabbi Baruch Manus, wrote the following to all those who had originally received the book. Dear friend, the Lakewood Cheda School takes pride in the high standard of education it affords its students. In keeping with this tradition, the Cheda has made available to its many friends and supporters books of interest on a broad range of Jewish subjects, books that serve to promote the lofty ideals of the great Torah luminaries of past generations. Your generous support, in turn, has made it possible for us not only to continue sending such books, but to continue the vital work of providing a level of chinuch in keeping with the standards Klal Yisrael expects from the children of the Beis Medrash Gavar community. We remain grateful for your help and look forward to support in the future. Regretfully, however, the book you recently received titled My Uncle the Nitziv does not meet these standards. 
It does not correctly portray the Nitziv, his Ashkofas, Kedusha, and Yerash Shamayim, as related to us by his revered Talmidim, the ones who knew him best. My uncle, the Nitziv, as an example of the true Nitziv, his son, Hagon Arav Chaim Berlin, quotes his father regarding his decision to close the doors of the famed Velozhenya Yeshiva rather than introducing secular studies into its program. Do not be anguished that this matter brings about my departure from this world, for it is well worth the sacrifice of my life. Such a statement from the heart illustrates the depth of the Nativ's saintliness and his uncompromising principles regarding the primacy of Torah, whatever sacrifices it might entail. Upon consultation with Gadoile Torah, we recommend that the book not be read. If you wish, the Cheder will reimburse you for any donation you may have sent. Masura Publications joins us in sincerely apologizing for this error. Continues Rabbi Shechter. The anonymous Gadoile Torah who were consulted clearly did not share Rabbi Bullman's positive assessment of the content and value of this work and recommended that it be recalled. What was it in this work by the author of the Torah Tamima that was found to be so objectionable? Which aspects of it do not correctly portray the Ashkofer's Kedusha and Yerushalayim of the Nitziv to the extent that it was deemed inappropriate to be read? Was it its dis- the description of my uncle's habit of reading the weekly newspapers, even on Shabbos, and discussing current events at the Shabbos table? Was it his noting that the Nativ had secular books in his library? Some have suggested that the opposition to the work was based on Rabbi Epstein's statement, in the name of his uncle, that had the Rambam studied Torah with a group of scholars instead of by himself, he would have avoided any number of errors he made in Mishnah Torah. Perhaps it was this acknowledgement that the Rambam simply erred in his psak halacha that made some people uncomfortable. In all probability, as the context of the Lakewood Cheder school letter indicates, their reconsideration was related to Rabbi Epstein's assertion that at one point the Nitziv did permit secular studies in Volozhin and allowed the yeshiva to be closed only in 1892, when submitting to the escalating demands of the Russian authorities would have resulted in changing its entire character. This apparently ran contrary to the tradition accepted by the Gedoyle Torah, referred to in the letter that the Nativ had made, quote, his decision to close the doors of the famed Velozhny Yeshiva rather than introducing secular studies into its program. So ends my quote from Rabbi Shechter's article. Rav Shechter's article continues, and we will refer back to it later, but it would appear that despite Rabbi Chaim Berlin's protestations to the contrary, the Nitziv not only permitted reading newspapers which contained secular non-Torah material, but he permitted reading them on Shabbos, and he himself would read them on Shabbos. Rav Epstein writes that literally every Jewish newspaper that came out, all of them published by various shades of maskilim, had the Nativ as a freebie subscriber, and he read them all cover to cover. The Nativ's son, Rabbi Meir Ba'ilan, who was both Rabbi Epstein's cousin and nephew, writes that no one at home was allowed to read any of the newspapers before the Nativ had been through them, and he would get a delivery of newspapers twice a week. Incidentally, in 2009, after over 20 years at the helm of the Lakewood Cheder, the main educational institution of Lakewood with over 4,000 children enrolled, Rabbi Manus was the subject of a coup orchestrated by Van Holler of BMG, who engineered a teacher's strike in the wake of financial difficulties so that the Vaad of the Cheder could take control of the institution from Rabbi Manus, who they feared wielded too much power. Last I heard, Rabbi Manus was syndicating real estate deals in Lakewood, (laughs) and probably better off doing that. But as you can see, monkey business, apropos the control of an independent Torah institution, did not end in 19th century Volozhin. It remains alive and well in 21st century New Jersey. 
But again, I digress. Let's go back to the nativ. The nativ was by no means a one-dimensional extreme traditionalist. He was a deeply nuanced and complex individual. But nevertheless, he had very firm ideas about educating the next generation of Torah scholars. And after 1853, when he found himself at the helm of Volozhin, the Jewish world's premier institution of Torah learning, he was utterly determined to remain pure to its founding ideal of Torah Lishma. The native was completely undeterred by those who tried to chip away at his vice-like control of the yeshiva, whether they were family members or whether they were part of the Russian government. His pride and joy was that he was raising the standard, presiding over the ultimate form of advanced Torah education, emulating the legendary Talmudic era yeshivas of Yavne and Sura and Padisa, where the foundation of Judaism was established for all time. The appointment of Rav Yosheb Soloveitchik as a deputy Rosh Hashiva was conceived of as a solution to the threat from Rabbi Levin, but it precipitated a whole new crisis. The Nativ had never worked with Rabbi Soloveitchik before and felt that he had been imposed on him without consideration of the implications. The two rabbis had very different personalities and styles. The Nativ was a solid and diligent scholar, detail-oriented, very pious, while of Yosheb Soloveitchik was a brilliant scholar, sharp and incisive, exciting and thrilling in his presentation of Talmudic lectures. The students soon split into two groups, those who were partial to the Nativ and those who loved Rabbi Yosheb Soloveitchik. Within a short period of time, the yeshiva once again descended into anarchy, with two factions engaged in bitter dispute with each other. By 1856, unable to resolve the dispute internally, external assistance was once again called in. One of the principal arbitrators was a rising star of the Lithuanian rabbinic fraternity, Rabbi Yitzhak Elchanan Specter, the Rav of Navardic, but who as later as the Rav of Kovna would become the foremost rabbinic authority of the Ashkenazi Jewish world, the first truly international Godel Hador, whose rabbinic rulings would impact Russia, Poland, North America, South America, Eretz Yisrael, South Africa, England, France. In fact, wherever there were Jews, his view would be sought and honored. The dispute between the Nativ and Rav Soloveitchik was about the governance of the yeshiva, but it was also about personal finances, namely the appropriate salary for both rabbis. The decision, when it came, favored Rav Soloveitchik on both counts. But in spite of the ruling in Rav Soloveitchik's favor, the Nativ seems to have maintained his powerful hold over the yeshiva. And when, in 1864, Rav Yosheb Soloveitchik was offered the opportunity to become the rabbi of Slutsk. He grabbed that opportunity with both hands and gladly left Volozhin. But notwithstanding the fact that he had left Volozhin, Rav Yosheb Soloveitchik, the Beis Halevi's family, was to play an integral part in the drama that unfolded in the final years of the yeshiva, as we shall see. After Rav Yosheb Soloveitchik left for Slutz, he was replaced by another Rav Chaim Volozhin descendant, Rav Chaim Hillel Fried, son of Rav Levi Yitzchok. We have a rather strange, seemingly posthumous image of Rav Chaim Hillel, here it is, who died in 1911. His grandson, Professor Chaim Hillel Fried, a Holocaust survivor who went through hell in various concentration camps, was one of the best known cardiologists in Israel in the early years of the state. He died in 2008. The Nativ was not on good terms with Reb Chaim Hillel, and when Reb Chaim Hillel became sick in the, in the late 1860s, he simply dismissed him from his post. In 1870, Reb Chaim Hillel tried to regain his position with the full and very vocal support of Rabbi Lyo Chaim Maizel, then the rabbi of Lomja, later the rabbi of Lodz, one of the most influential graduates that Volozhin Yeshiva ever had. But it was to no avail. He was out. And that was it. So Rabbi Chaim Hillel tried to install his brother-in-law, Rabbi Avram Dov, to give shiurim at Velozhin Yeshiva and launched a campaign to get it done. Rabbi Tzokokhan Specter 
and Rav Meiser were both behind him. But the Nativ was not interested in inviting more conflict into the yeshiva, and he adamantly refused to concede. Instead, he appointed his son-in-law, Rabbi Rafael Shapira, as deputy Rosh Yeshiva, consolidating his position as head of a lojin once and for all. Or so he thought. For a few years, there was peace at the yeshiva, and then in 1875, the Natsiv's wife, Reina Batya, became sick and died. Suddenly, the Natsiv was left exposed. He was not a member of the family, and he was no longer married to a member of the family. Although he still made regular financial payments to the descendants of Reb Chaim of Alojin, he was now the head of a yeshiva that they could legitimately claim was their asset, not his. Who would replace him if he died? What would happen to the yeshiva if control was taken away from him? Velozhin was highly respected and widely supported both financially and in terms of the respect and admiration it had among rabbis and the wider community. But it was on very shaky foundations. But the Nativ had an incredible stroke of luck, or perhaps it was a stroke of genius. Two years earlier, his granddaughter, Lifsha, daughter of Rabbi Rafael Shapira, had married Chaim Soloveitchik, the son of Rabbi Yoshebe Soloveitchik, after the Nativ buried the hatchet with his former rival. The young Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, who was both a direct descendant of Reb Chaim of Volozhin, after whom he was named, and now married to a descendant of Reb Chaim of Volozhin, it's a very convenient shidduch, don't you agree? If I may say so, moved in with his in-laws in Volozhin, and soon afterwards began giving shiurim to the Volozhin students. Amazingly, as it turned out, not only was Reb Chaim Soloveitchik a stunning, but I mean stunning Talmud Chacham, original, sharp, brilliant, and everything else, he was also an absolutely excellent Magid Shir. His Talmud lectures were simply outstanding. They were breathtaking. The Nativ was a solid scholar with an unparalleled depth and breadth of knowledge. And Volozhin students loved and appreciated his lectures. But Rab Chaim Soloveitchik was like a bolt of lightning, offering insights into Talmudic topics that had never previously been explored. He captivated the students with his unbridled genius and was incredibly kind to boot. His house was always full of students, day and night. And not only he mentored them, and educated them, he also befriended them, and he became beloved. <sighs> my father, my late father, Zichrona Levrocha, used to have a sign on his desk at his office when I was growing up, which said, every time I was about to make ends meet, somebody moved the ends. <laughs> the scene I have just described regarding Velozhin should have heralded a period of absolute bliss. All the ends had finally met. There were no more family disputes, nor any concern for one on the horizon. The students were flocking to the yeshiva. According to some historians, the yeshiva had as many as 500 students making the lodging by far the largest yeshiva in the world. The finances of the yeshiva were steady and stable, or, or as steady as stable as the finances of any yeshiva can ever be. And most crucially, the Natsiv was finally in total control, with no one threatening his leadership or his vision for the yeshiva. But sadly, somebody always moves the ends. It's so true. During the next 15 plus years, even as the Lajin Yeshiva thrived and vibrated with the energy of 24-7 learning. And by the way, I mean that. There was learning in the base medrash of Elohim Yeshiva 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including Yom Kippur. They used to have groups of Bochrim used to take it in turns, some of them studying for 36 hours without break. I read somewhere, I can't say that it's true or not true, that the idea of making doctors stay up for 36 hours when they train came from Volozhin Yeshiva. 
24 hours a day, seven days a week learning. That's what was going on in the Lodge and Yeshiva. Nevertheless, events conspired in the background that resulted in the humiliating collapse of the great Velozhin Yeshiva. The reason, reason usually given for the closure of the Yeshiva, as I said earlier, is the insistence of the Russian government to include secular studies as part of the curriculum of the Yeshiva. And rather than see his beloved Yeshiva become compromised by the introduction of foreign non-Torah subjects, the native shuttered Velozhin and closed it down for good. But like all stories that sound too convenient, you just know that there's more to this story than that, and there is. The first factor was the increased phenomenon of Haskalah among the Jewish community of Eastern Europe. It took a century to permeate through to the ordinary folk of the traditional Jewish world, but by the 1860s, there were over 100 modernizing schools for Jews in the Pale of Settlement, products of the project originally initiated by Dr. Max Lilienthal, about whom we heard earlier. Many of the graduates of these schools abandoned Judaism entirely, but quite a number of them remained committed to Judaism, but at the same time, they were very critical of the existing structure of Jewish life, in particular, the yeshiva's system, with its exclusive focus on Talmud study. Rabbi J.J. Shachter cites an 1876 article about Volozhin written by a Hebrew language journalist in a Haskalah periodical called Hashachar, titled Andrala Musya. The title was itself an indication as to the orientation of its author. An asterisk after the word refers the reader to a note at the bottom of the page which defines Andralamusia as a contagious disease, a sort of yeshiva coronavirus. The article was particularly disrespectful to the Natsiv. When Volozhin was led by Reb Chaim of Volozhin and his son Reb Itzela, wrote the author, the students were allowed to study subjects other than Gemara. But now the Natsiv had, quote, strong-armed guardians, unquote, who monitored the students and would raid the dormitory if there was any suspicion that they were engaged in secular studies. What is so interesting is that students who were interested in secular studies were equally interested in studying in Volozhin. But they were. They wanted the best of both worlds. They wanted to hear a shear from the great Natsiv. They wanted to hear the unmatched Reb Chaim Soloveitchik. And at the same time, they wanted to read Russian literature and learn about science and philosophy. But the cat and mouse game between them and the Natsiv elevated tensions in the yeshiva and led to the creation of secret societies within the yeshiva. The societies that were discovered by Bialik when he arrived in Volozhin in 1890. One such society, Nestsiona, a proto-Zionist group, even secretly published its own newspaper until the society was eventually shut down by the Russian authorities in 1889. Two of its members went on to become brothers-in-law, married to two sisters, as well as two of the most important rabbis of the early 20th century yeshiva world. Rabbi Moshe Mordre Epstein, Rosh Yeshiva of Slabodka and later Chevron, and Rabbi Issa Zalman Meltzer, Rosh Yeshiva of Slutsk, and then Eitz Chaim in Yerushalayim. The Natsiv was fiercely opposed to secret societies, particularly the ones that encouraged Haskalah and secular studies, but he seems to have been powerless to prevent them from existing and being active. And he was also dealing with other endemic and profound problems in the yeshiva, not the least of which was chronic financial issues during its latter years. The wealthy Jews of Russia were by and large less traditional and were not willing to donate generously to an institution that did not really reflect their way of thinking. For example, in 1885, Baron Horace Ginsberg, the wealthiest and most influential Jew in the Russian Empire, gave 100 rubles to Volozhin Yeshiva. 
and in the same year he gave almost 8,000 rubles to the Society for the Promotion of Culture Among Jews, an organization that actively promoted assimilation for the Jews of Russia. In other words, his 100 rubles to Volozhin was so that no one could say he didn't give something, but it was a meaningless donation that did little to help the yeshiva survive. Considering, listen to this, that the entire budget of Volozhin was just about 16,000 rubles a year, a donation of 8,000 rubles would have been a lifesaver, or perhaps not. After all, would the Natsiv really have wanted money from someone whose generosity would have been accompanied by demands for the yeshiva to change its stance on traditional Jewish education? In fact, most of the money donated to Volozhin came specifically from individuals who saw the yeshiva as a safeguard against assimilation. This undoubtedly empowered the Natsiv to a greater extent to resist internal attempts by students to subvert the traditional fundament that underpinned Volozhin and had since, and had since its inception. The financial struggles of the yeshiva affected the student-faculty relations, as many of the students relied not just on scholarships, but also on financial support for food and lodging. And when the yeshiva cash flow was bad, the allowances were reduced accordingly, causing hardship and resentment. In 1884, the Natsiv was forced to refuse admission for a student with no money. The young man attempted suicide, and the story found its way into the newspaper, forcing the Natsiv to issue an apology and an explanation. Everyone said that they understood, but the optics were terrible. In 1886, the yeshiva building burnt down, along with many houses in Volozhin, as they were all <coughs> built of wood. A new structure was built for the yeshiva. That building still stands to this day, but only half the 10,000 ruble cost of rebuilding was raised. The repercussions were incredibly strenuous for the aging Natsiv, who simply could not cope with the stress of running both the educational and the financial elements of the yeshiva. And then there were the Russian authorities, always snapping at the heels of the yeshiva, trying to get this flagship Jewish Institute of Higher Education to teach secular subjects. Time and again they had attempted, often with the help of assimilated Jews, to take control of the curriculum at Volozhin. In the late 1850s, again in the mid to late eight, um, 1860s, again in 1863, then again in 1879. Each time, the Natsiv and his supporters had outsmarted them, sometimes by offering basic lessons in arithmetic and Russian, and on other occasions using bribery, and yet on other occasions by pretending to adopt robust secular educational classes, thereby dispatching the threat and then reverting back to the traditional yeshiva curriculum once the heat was off. As Volozhin did not take any money from the Russian government, there was actually nothing the authorities could do to enforce secular studies there, besides for closing the yeshiva down, which they threatened to do on a number of occasions. Thankfully, the Natsiv had always been one step ahead of the authorities. But by the late 1880s, the Natsiv was very tired. In 1887, he was called to a conference in St. Petersburg, arranged by Shmuel Polyakov, a Russian Jewish millionaire intent on reforming the state of Jewish affairs in Russia. And while he was away, probably not by accident, the yeshiva was raided by inspectors. It would seem likely that some of the students were involved in denouncing the yeshiva to the authorities. The Natsiv returned to Volozhin and tried to sort out the mess. But as the process dragged on, it became clear that the authorities were determined to have their way or close the yeshiva down. In December 1889, just before Bialik came to the yeshiva, the governor of the Vilna district ordered that Volozhin yeshiva be shut down, as it was clear the yeshiva did not comply with its own commitments to the authorities to add secular studies to the curriculum. In response to this real threat, the Natsiv relented and allowed a formal program of secular studies at Volozhin Yeshiva. 
Soon there were about 50 boys who regularly attended the classes. The authorities demanded the number increase to at least 100, but it seems this number was never met. Still, this was a massive concession, the thin end of a wedge that the Nativ had thought would never threaten his yeshiva. But even as the Nativ battled the authorities, the real battle had nothing to do with secular studies. Once again, the Lozhin yeshiva found itself in the midst of a bitter battle for succession. Who was going to be the next Rosh Hashiva? One would have thought that the automatic successor would be Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, who had taught at the yeshiva for more than 10 years and was extremely popular among the students. But the Natsiv had apparently never seen Reb Chaim as anything more than the deputy Rosh Hashiva, and he reserved the Rosh Hashiva spot for his oldest son, Reb Chaim Berlin. Born in 1832, Chaim Berlin married young to the daughter of a wealthy man who initially supported the couple. But in 1865, his father-in-law died and Rabbi Berlin was compelled to take a job. He became the chief rabbi of Moscow, not a city known for its devout Orthodox community. He stayed there until the passing of his wife in 1883. Within months, he was married to Tila, the wealthy and independently successful widow of a Hasidic timber dealer from Biala. Tilla refused to move to Moscow. So Rabbi Berlin moved to her mansion in Biala, where he spent his days studying while she ran the business. Then, one Shabbos in 1891, while on a walk with her nieces, Tilla collapsed and died. She was just 50 years old. For several years, the Natsiv had been asking his son to move to Volozhin to help him run the yeshiva and to take on the role of Rosh Yeshiva in waiting. Rabbi Berlin had shown no particular interest, but in the wake of his second wife's unexpected death, he moved to Volozhin and, and began to involve himself in the administration of the yeshiva. Within the yeshiva, the appointment was the cause of great resentment. Rabbi Berlin had never been involved with the yeshiva, and had never shown interest in teaching or working with students before. He also began instituting new rules and regulations to try and get the yeshiva into shape, and many of the students were angry to see things changing. Most importantly, Reb Chaim Soloveitchik's avid fans felt that it was a slight to their beloved mentor's honor for someone like Reb Chaim Berlin, who was not a scholar at the level of Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, to be appointed to a position above him. In fact, rumors began to circulate that Rabbi Soloveitchik was thinking of leaving Volozhin now that he was being marginalized and usurped. Things began to escalate. The Natsiv, feeling under siege from every side, became short-tempered with his students. On Sukkot 1891, a group of students broke into Reb Chaim Berlin's house and stole his Lul of an Esrug. <laughs> You couldn't make this stuff up, could you? <laughs> when Reb Chaim Soloveitchik condemned the theft, he was also targeted. Almost daily, there were riots and fights in the yeshiva. A number of students were expelled, and the members of the local community were warned not to house the ringleaders. Some of the students came to Rabbi Berlin to ask for forgiveness, but not all of them. One. Yossel Mardcha Glashtein left Volozhin and was found dead a week later in mysterious circumstances. In an address to the yeshiva shortly afterwards, Reb Chaim Berlin indicated that Glashtein had been the subject of heavenly justice and that is why he had died. This was too much for his friends, many of whom were also interested in more secular classes at Volozhin, and saw Rabbi Berlin as an uneducated throwback, threatening the future of broader education at the yeshiva with regressive measures. In late December, a group of students wrote a scathing letter to the authorities to express their displeasure at Reb Chaim Berlin's appointment, pointing out that all the progress made by the yeshiva in recent years was now under threat by, quote, Chaim Berlin 
a very nasty and terrible enemy of the Enlightenment, close quote. The letter ends with the words, save us, save us. It is possible that the letter was a forgery, but even if it was not, and all the student authors wanted was for the authorities to ensure that Reb Chaim Berlin was removed from his post, this letter proved to be the final straw. The authorities issued an ultimatum. The faculty needed to be qualified in Russian and various other higher education subjects, and the yeshiva needed to provide several hours a day secular studies instruction, otherwise it would need to be closed. Effectively, the yeshiva had reached the point where the authorities felt that keeping it open was more trouble than anyone could handle. There was no expectation that these measures would be accepted and met, nor that the administration was cohesive enough to offer any kind of alternative. On January 22nd, 1892, the yeshiva was formally closed down. All the students were ordered home to wherever they lived. The closure order included a stipulation that the Natsiv, Reb Chaim Berlin and Reb Chaim Soloveitchik were forbidden to be in the Vilna district, Volozhin was in the Vilna district, for the next three years. Rav Soloveitchik joined his father in Brisk and took over as the rabbi of that city when his father died six months later. The Natsiv and Reb Chaim Berlin went to Warsaw refugees from Volozhin trying to raise money to pay off the yeshiva's considerable debts. The stress proved too much for the Natsiv and he became sick and died the following year, a broken man. Even in death, he never made it back to his beloved Volozhin and he was buried in the sprawling Warsaw Jewish Cemetery. Three years later, his son-in-law, Rabbi Rafal Shapira, reopened the yeshiva on a much smaller scale, but the great Volozhin yeshiva, the legendary center of Torah excellence and source of some of the greatest rabbis for Jewish life during the 19th century and well in the t into the 20th century, was gone forever. And that, my friends, is the story of the rise and fall of the Volozhin yeshiva.